Hello and welcome um, to the first ever Blueprint Institute public event. My name is Harry Guinness. I'm the CEO of Blueprint Institute. For those who don't yet know us, we are an ambitious new think tank established to enrich public debate with evidence-based research that is consistent with market principles. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet, pay my respects to elders past, present, emerging, and celebrate the diversity of Indigenous peoples and their ongoing connections to the land. Today, I'm excited to be moderating an exceptional panel. Um, I would like to welcome the panelists, Kate Carnell, uh, who really needs no introduction. Kate is the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman, previously the CEO of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, Beyond Blue and Australian Food and Grocery Council. Thank you, Kate. Pleasure. Um, Mark McKenzie, who is the chair of COSBOA, the Council of Small Business Organisations of Australia, uh, and who has wide ranging commercial and public policy experience. G'day, Mark, thank you. Hello, and, Harry. and Leah Kirsten, uh, Nee Fitzpatrick, who has worked in small business as a bookkeeper and operations manager for 20 years, most recently running her own practice and working as a registered BAS agent. Leah has joined today's panel to share her own experiences of COVID-19 and how they've played out for her family run business and for many of her clients. So thank you, Leah, for joining us. Thanks, Harry. So um, why are we here tonight? Well, um, small businesses are the engine of the economy. They contribute over 35% of Australia's GDP, employ 44% of the workforce, and account for 92% of companies that innovate, driving growth and job creation. These are the businesses on which we all rely, but which sadly lack the deep reserves of capital that enable larger businesses to navigate the current recession. State and federal governments have stepped in to save lives and control the virus. But our economy has suffered and um, it has suffered its largest hit in a century and it's no secret that small businesses are suffering. Small businesses account for 87% of total enrolments in JobKeeper, which is an estimated 750,000 small businesses. To qualify for JobKeeper, they must have experienced a 30% decline in revenue. Sadly, of course, for many businesses, and I think particularly for those in Victoria, um, the reductions in revenue have been far more severe than 30%. In the context of COVID-19, small businesses are suffering through no fault of their own. And given their ongoing sacrifices, um, I, I think there's actually a strong moral case for governments to come to their aid. Uh, equally, there's an undeniable economic case for government to kickstart what is essentially the engine of the economy. And without that support, uh, I think we're all in trouble. So, irrespective of the issues of lockdowns and how long they will continue, uh, at Blueprint, we worry that governments aren't prepared to do enough and aren't currently doing enough for small businesses. To rebound from COVID-19, businesses need access to capital, they need the right skills, and they need a favourable regulatory environment. Last month, we released our second report at Blueprint Institute, um, Kickstarting the Engine, Short-Term Support for Australia's Small Businesses which really tackled some of these challenges that are faced by businesses. Um, for those who haven't had the time to read through the 50 pages, I would highly recommend it. Um, the executive summary in particular is uh, a short and sharp read, which conveys the key evidence and arguments. Um, but whilst I don't wanna talk for um, too much longer, I will take the liberty to run through our key recommendations in that report and, um, and allow the panelists to respond um, in part to those recommendations and then to your questions. So in our report, we, we put forward three key recommendations. The first is we reviewed the merits of a publicly funded hex style loan scheme to support small businesses to invest and to grow. And we, we really think a hex style or a revenue contingent loan scheme stacks up on the available evidence. A revenue contingent loan idea has been around for quite a while. In fact, our work was inspired by an ANU professor called Bruce Chapman and his work in the area. 
Uh, in fact, revenue contingent loans uh, obviously work in the university context with the HEX schemes, and they've been championed in other areas such as um, with drought affected farmers, who for obvious reasons have fluctuating and unpredictable revenue streams, uh, and who could probably benefit from a similar scheme. In our report, we argued that such a scheme could replace the existing SME guarantee scheme introduced by the federal government. We applaud the thinking of the federal government in, um, in uh, extending capital to small businesses, but note that the uptake from businesses has been relatively poor. In fact, of the 40 billion first set aside for the scheme, only 1.5 billion has been taken up. So with banks charging around 5% of interest and requiring securement for loans, um, it's little surprise that in the current environment, businesses have been either unwilling or unable to access that capital. Um, the, the poor uptake represents flaws, which can be responded to with a revenue contingent loan. So we're obviously familiar with the, a, an income contingent loan from a HEX scheme. Um, I mean, we, we note that they work because the government loans at discounted rates to individuals because the government understands the net benefit that that education system and the education to individuals has for society and the economy. Uh, during COVID-19, we believe a similar principle applies to small businesses where there's a net benefit to be returned to, to all of us. So our second recommendation is for a state-backed voucher scheme for small businesses to access a financial health check. So this is a means by which businesses can go to a trusted advisor, similar to, to Leah, to get, um, to get support on restructuring and assessing um, how best to survive uh, the current recession. Um, if a financial health, health check was passed, then businesses would get access to that revenue contingent loan scheme. And this is a way to reduce the risks that um, the government's dispensing money to businesses that will be insolvent and won't survive lockdown. Of course, for those businesses that fail the health check and, and um, are deemed ineligible for the loan, um, they also benefit because they're given advice about how to restructure and um, to go through the insolvency process. To complement these measures, we advocate that the government extends COVID safe harbour provisions till the end of March 21 in line with JobKeeper extension. Uh, this will help save money from the looming insolvency cliff and the distress to business owners um, and increase their prospects of survival. Uh, finally, the third recommendation in our report is that we focus on the problem of skills, um, which are really important for small businesses and which will be important in the early stages of the recovery. In 2019, 50% of businesses said that the availability of suitable labor limited their output. So we can only imagine how much worse that problem is getting for businesses with state border closures and international border closures. We recommend that the government um, looks at prioritizing visa arrivals for skilled migrants to fill um, skill shortages and, um, and utilising workers currently in Australia and um, getting them into the workforce. So um, to summarise, uh, our report finds that by increasing small business access to capital, by implementing an insolvency checkpoint and by setting skilled migration targets, Australia can lay the foundations for a, uh, for a small business led recovery. That's our thesis, but we've got a, a panel with us today and I am really keen to hear their thoughts. So without further ado, um, let's get stuck into some discussion. Kate, I might start with you. Um, can you share with us um, just how bad circumstances are at the moment for small businesses? Um, what are the range of factors contributing to the situation? Um, particularly in Victoria, and what are you hearing from, from your networks? Look, thanks, Harry. Can I just start by thanking the Blueprint Institute? Because I'm sure Mark would join with me saying, look, there is so little work done in the small business space by think tanks generally. Uh, it's just wonderful to see um, a think tank 
um, understand, you know, that we that small business is the engine room and getting the parameters, the settings right for small business right now is the difference between, you know, when Australia all, you know, comes out of this really. So thank you very much for doing something that is, I have to say, all too rarely done. But look, let's, I'll just, I'll just start by, by giving a bit of an overview. Okay, there are just over 2.3 billion uh, sorry, 2.3 million businesses in Australia. 2.2 million of those are small businesses. Uh, if you look at the ATO definition of um, businesses under $10 million turnover, 99% of businesses fall into that category. Let's use an ABS stat, under 20 employees, 97% of businesses in that space. We employ about half the workforce, depending on what definition um, you use, and we're around about 40% of GDP or a bit more if we use the 10 million figure. So this is a very, very large part of the, of the Australian economy. Now, the latest figures that we have on the impact at the moment come out of actually New South Wales rather than Victoria. Uh, and these are September figures. They're showing that 69% uh, that of all businesses have experienced a reduction in income since, um, since January, but the mean reduction decrease is 45%, you know, which is huge. Now, this is even before we really take into account what's happening in, uh, in Victoria right now. So the figures are large. Um, and the impact is, are pretty big. And the other thing that we've got to remember is small businesses by their nature are small and therefore they don't have um, big buckets of money sitting around, uh, you know, waiting to be used if all of a sudden their revenue uh, dries up. Uh, they also don't have uh, investors knocking on the door saying, we'll just give you some money to help you, to help you keep going. Um, these are, well, I think 70% of, of us are family businesses, um, businesses that are owned and operated by families of various sizes. So the money that's in small businesses is the owner's money or the family's um, money. So that sort of a reduction is has a huge impact. So look, let's just have a look at, um, I just want to scope the problem for a moment. So what's happened right now is that for a large number of those 45, you know, businesses that have got a 45% reduction, they've got JobKeeper, this is good. You know, it's been a lifeline, there's no doubt. But what they've also done is a very a good percentage of them have pushed out their bank loans. You know, the bank said you don't have to pay your usual bank payments uh, for six months, up, and that sort of finishes at the end of September, but the banks have indicated they'll push that out to March for, you know, for, people who still need it, uh, but interest is compounding. So you might not be paying your, you know, paying your, your bank payments every month, but the interest on your, on your loan is, is, um, is compounding. Um, the ABA, uh, sorry, the, the ATO has said, uh, you, you don't have to pay what, what you owe us. We'll enter into a payment agreement, but you don't have to make any payments for a period for a period of time. Okay, this is good. You do have to talk to the ATO about a payment approach. You can't just assume that it happened, but that that's the case. There's also the mandatory commercial tenancy code. Now that's to help with commercial tenancies, obviously, and that code fundamentally says that you can have up to a 50% reduction in your rent and the other 50% plus usually can be deferred. Now, what all this means is that you've got deferred rent. And I'll just give you one example. I was speaking to um, a company that has um, childcare, it's not a childcare facility, but they have child, um, children's play um, areas or business. Um, their deferred rent by um, October, the end of October when they may be able to open in Victoria, they're in Melbourne, uh, the deferred rent will be $80,000. So you're talking about large amounts of money here. Uh, so um, what we're seeing is deferred rent, deferred interest, 
you have to start paying your bank again, you'll have to start paying the ATO again, and job uh, keeper um, will reduce at the um, beginning of October from $1,500 to $1,200 um, a, a fortnight, and then down to $1,000 in January. Um, and for people who work less than 20 hours a week to $750 um, a fortnight, and then down to $650 in, in January, and that finishes in March. So what we're seeing, as um, Harry, you said, is we're seeing a whole lot of things all um, you know, um, run on top of each other in terms of um, challenges for small businesses and need for cash flow over the, the next few months and past that. Because even um, for businesses that offer, and then of course, there's the businesses who will no longer be able to get JobKeeper at all after the end of this month because they are no longer 30% down. 25% down, you get nothing. Um, so, if, so there's another group of businesses that will lose JobKeeper um, sooner as well. So I suppose the, the message I'm saying is that um, there is a huge need to understand the cash flow requirements of, uh, of small business um, going forward, shall we say, starting at the end of this month, but really crystallising um, as we go forward to, uh, to March. You know, and I don't think any of us think that we're going to have that the economy is going to be back to anything that vaguely looks normal um, next March, anywhere in Australia, particularly in Victoria. But I don't want to underestimate the problems with certain parts of the economy. You know, you don't want to be a travel agent anywhere in Australia. Um, the tourism industry in Queensland with border closures is in a world of pain. If you've got a business that relies on aviation, you're in um, a world of pain. If you're in the arts or events, no matter where you are in Australia, you're in a world of pain. So it's certainly worse in Victoria, but don't underestimate the large numbers of businesses right around Australia that um, are really struggling. Um, I probably have to put leisure into that with things like gyms and so on, which in many, many places are unable to, to open. I could keep going, but I won't because we've got to keep going today. But I'm trying to put it in context, that's what we're facing. Thanks, Kate. Um, clearly, you know, it's there are unprecedented times and um, there's a lot of complexity within the small business community itself and the solutions that are put forward need to be adaptable for all those different sectors that you've spoken to. Um, so I think that's something we, we can hopefully get to later in the, in the call. Um, Leah, let, let me come to you. Um, you're based in outer Melbourne. Uh, things are obviously really tough in Victoria at the moment and we're very grateful that you could join us. Thank you. Um, would you be happy to share the story of your business and what you've experienced over the, over the last six months? Sure. Um, firstly, thanks, Harry, and thanks for the invitation to be here this evening. Um, I will admit that I'm nervous to share our story, but I feel that it's really important for small businesses to be heard at the moment because I don't necessarily think that we are being heard enough by government. Um, so if it helps in any way, I'm happy to share um, our story. So as well as being a, a BAS agent, almost two years ago now, my husband Paul and I purchased a small learn to swim school in the northern suburbs of Melbourne. Paul is a, a swim instructor and it was to be his full time job. And I, of course, could manage the bookkeeping side of it and still continue with my practice. So it seemed to just be a good fit to both of our skill sets. The business was quite run down. We spent quite a bit of time um, building it. Uh, it's open seven days a week and we're there probably most, most of those days. Um, and we set about rebuilding and improving the reputation of the business, which we did. And the, the first major goal that we had set for ourselves in the business was to double the amount of children that we had enrolled. And we successfully did that in March of this year, which we were thrilled with. But little did we know, I guess, that within a week of hitting that goal, we literally come crashing down like a deck of cards. So the week that the Melbourne Grand Prix was cancelled, I guess, and borders were closed, 
everything started to turn on its head for us and lots of other businesses as well. We had people just stop showing up to classes, whereas our classes were full. We had parents emailing, pulling their children out of classes. And it, it literally was heartbreaking, to be honest, to turn up and see that in front of our eyes and to just not know where it was going. Um, we were named as part of the shutdowns in the first round of government shutdowns on March the 22nd. So we haven't opened our doors since then. Um, in terms of how we felt when we were shut down, I think it was probably just feelings of utter despair, I would say. Um, there was also a strange sense of calm when it was first announced because we'd, we'd been through such an emotional and it was just an exhausting week. So to actually get a result was somewhat calming. Um, but that, that week after we were shut down, I would almost describe it like a family member dying, which people would say is an overreaction, but literally something that we had nurtured and we'd given every spare minute we had and every dollar that we had to this business had literally just crumpled in front of us through, we felt no fault of our own and we just couldn't control it at all. So it was just feelings of absolute helplessness. When some government help was announced, I guess we, we started to feel a glimmer of hope that we would get through it. The federal cash boost, um, some state government money from the Victorian state government, and also JobKeeper, which was fantastic. So we at least had some hope that we could just hibernate for a couple of months until the situation settled and then we would reopen on the other side. We negotiated with our landlord because our takings are obviously down by 100%. So we're entitled to, um, as Kate mentioned earlier, defer 50% of our rent and waive 50% of our rent, which is fantastic result. However, anyone that's paid commercial rents will know, as Kate mentioned, that they are very high. And even at 50%, I don't mind telling you that the amounts that we are currently deferring keep me awake at night. Um, but, it was the best we could hope for in the circumstances. So we continued along in lockdown. In June, our industry was given a slight reprieve and we were able to uh, reopen. However, it was so highly restricted that us and many other student schools just looked at it and decided it just wasn't worth it at that point in time. We just, we could only literally have a very small amount of people through our doors. And the biggest one for us is that we, Weren't allowed, we weren't able to use our change rooms, which anyone that's lived in Melbourne in winter, in June, would know that the prospect of being told that you must take your two-year-old toddler out of our facility, dripping wet in their towel and not use our change rooms, just wasn't going to work for anyone. So, we, and, and also at that time, I think the confidence in the community was still quite low and we were in the depths of winter. So we decided to sort of wait and see and just see what happened. Another, I think around three weeks later, some more restrictions uh, were eased and we were allowed to use change rooms again. And by then, it generally seemed like the community was starting to become uh, more confident with the situation. So and we were getting a lot of inquiries from our parents about when we were reopening. So. We decided to take the plunge and we announced that we would reopen at the start of term four, which would have been mid-July. And unfortunately, in the few weeks that we had made that announcement to the time that we would have reopened, the COVID numbers in Melbourne escalated and we didn't actually get to reopen at all because Melbourne was in shutdown before that time. So, I guess we went through the, the roller coaster of emotions all over again, the feelings of despair, helplessness, when is this going to end, why are we in this situation, a lot of anger, I think, about some decisions that have been made that, that we felt had led us to the position we're in. Um, and we just, we didn't know what to do. I mean, we can't do anything, really. We just have to sit back and wait. Um, I was, however, grateful that we hadn't had a chance to reopen our doors again because I think emotionally to be shut down a second time 
would have been heartbreak all over again. So I was grateful for that. Um, there's been feelings of disbelief this time round too, that there hasn't been any more help announced, I think. We've had a very uh, a small grant from the Victorian state government, but nothing other than that. And I keep thinking that something will come, but to date it hasn't. Um, JobKeeper has been a fantastic lifeline and that's what the federal government keeps talking about, the help that they're giving. But for cases like us that have, have been in full closure, um, all JobKeeper is really doing for us is giving us a very basic wage and keeping our staff from Centrelink and keeping our staff engaged. But we haven't had the chance of reopening. So we haven't had the advantage of, of subsidised wages to try and get ahead a little bit. So we're hopeful that, that more help will come. Um, who knows? But in terms of the, I guess, the, the roadmap that was announced by the Victorian government, for us and the industry we're in, where, you know, we were first closed and we look like being last to reopen and thing as if it will be at least November. And by that time, we will have been closed for nine months. So that's difficult. Um, our, the aquatics industry that we're in, our industry bodies are fighting hard for us to say that we are a safe environment. Um, COVID can't live in chlorine, we're a controlled environment. We can't understand why we aren't given a chance to, to reopen earlier and to have a fighting chance. We'd rather go down fighting than, than just be sitting here not reopening at all. Um, but to date, I guess, it's getting them to listen. We seem to be getting lumped in with gyms and indoor leisure centres and we are quite a different industry. So, And there seems to be negative con uh, connotations that go, go with gyms and things. So we teach quite a different skill. I mean, we teach children to swim, which is a life-saving skill. And we, we feel that we're quite different to gyms in that sense. Um, and I guess morally for us, like we feel a real um, obligation to our clients in that we worry about this summer and what this summer brings for our children who haven't had swimming lessons for nine or 10 months by that time, because, you know, drowning um, rates are set to soar and, um, we are sitting back and not being able to change that at this point in time. So we do worry about when we can reopen, I think, and what the business landscape looks like for us at that time. Um, everything that we've built our business on seems to have changed. We're a very small um, family run centre and we pride ourselves on that. We, we know all of our family by name, we chat to them. They, they stay after class, you know, the children play together in the corner and that's all of a sudden, you know, now we're going to have to tell them, you know, you must leave really quickly, don't stand too close, all that sort of thing. So we're going to have to really rethink, I guess, the way that we operate and the way that we market ourselves. But like I said earlier, I guess we're, we're now at a point where we go just, you know, give us some sort of fighting chance to try at least. Um, Look, I mean, I guess where to from here? I mean, it brings us up to today where we're still closed um, and we're just, we're, we're playing the waiting game. We're sort of almost stuck, I guess, like a lot of small businesses in an impossible situation where we've got costs and, and rent mounting. Um, we don't want to walk away because it is our, our livelihood and there's a lot of pride involved in what we've done and, and we've invested a lot in it. Um, but at the same time, we're also bound by a lease agreement, but we can't trade. So we're sort of very much stuck in, I guess, an impossible situation, just waiting for a lifeline, I guess. Leah, thank you so much for sharing. Um, uh, really, it sounds like, you know, you feel like you're at the mercy of decisions that are out of your control. And I think your story helps to demonstrate how um, one size fits all solutions can work in the short term, but absolutely not a long-term solution to the, um, the health and the economic challenges that we're facing as a nation. Um, I wanna look back um, shortly to hear your thoughts on, um, on some policy measures that might help. But first, um, Mark, if we can come to you, um, how does Leah's story resonate with your experiences um, uh, from within your member organisations? Well, first, Harry, what I'd like to do is just uh, reinforce Kate's comments earlier about saying it's great to have uh, your institute focusing on this and bringing 
um, the small business issues to the table. Um, so thanks to that and thanks to the team. It's great to stand alongside Kate um, and talk through these issues again. I think Leah's story for me is very typical of what you see about small business. We talk about small business investing, but they don't just invest dollars. They invest their heart, their mind and their soul. And you can hear that listening to Leah. Um, I'll be fairly short with my comments because I'd like to sort of um, take you through next, but let me just talk about two concepts. The first is normal uncertainty. So what we get in a situation here is that you typically will see a business owner or a, a prospective business owner like Leah that says, we're going to have a punt at something. We're going to back ourselves at doing something and creating our own livelihood by contributing to the economy. And, and even the comment towards the end there where Leah was talking about you know, the facilities become a place where community congregates. We're going to be part of the community. We're going to engage in that way. It's very typical of what you hear from small business owners. Within that context, nothing's ever guaranteed. So you're always going to deal with a level of normal uncertainty of other customers going to come? Are my costs going to go up? How am I going to deal with issues that come through? What's inflation going to do? What's the treasury going to do each year? That's a normal uncertainty that we in business have to deal with. And in small business, you're generally um, at the forefront of that. You're, you're literally the canary in the coal mine where you're being affected by um, a big bank coming out and saying consumer sentiment's actually dipped. You'll notice that it's a tilt for the next week or two as people are actually believing in that. And so for the, in that context, um, what you hear in Leah's story is someone that's been confident and said, we're gonna back herself, we're gonna create a livelihood and invest our heart, our minds and our money in a business. And that's a very typical story. And I think the, the challenge that we have now in front of us though, is that we're not in normal uncertainty. We're in unprecedented uncertainty. And so when you listen to Leah's story now talking about locking down in March, working on the basis that, you know, we're probably gonna be out, at that stage we were all talking September, but we were starting to get some very positive signs that suggest businesses were starting to reopen in June. And going back to the concept of a business owner is normally optimistic. Your sense is, okay, well, I'm going to get ready to prepare for reopening and, and kick my business off again. And I thought, Leah, your comment about, I'm actually thankful that I didn't reopen and then have to go through the trauma of closing again. I think there have been a series of people that have gone through that process and it, it's not been a good process. It's not been pretty. But I think even the, the challenge that's occurring in Victoria at the moment of people had been banking on the fact that we would start to be reopening now. And therefore a lot of the, I would say desolation that we're hearing now from small business owners is they were planning for that reopening stage and now are being told it's probably another seven weeks before I deal with it. So I think the challenge for us in policy is this is not normal uncertainty. This is unprecedented uncertainty. So unprecedented means we need to do things differently. And that means that we need to look at how to support these businesses differently, how these businesses secure finance differently to the way we've traditionally done in a way that navigates an environment where no one can actually predict with any certainty, not even normal uncertainty, about what might actually turn out. And it's, it's in that context that I think we're calling for different solutions and some of those are probed in your paper, Harry. So I'll, I'll leave it at that point. Um, but Leah, I just, it's a heartfelt story as a business owner myself, having gone through that, I was lucky enough, I went through the global financial crisis with my business. And I think the anxiety that you live with in that business, particularly where you're living hand to mouth, um, I get a bit annoyed listening to some of the commentary that's occurring in Victoria at the moment that, that is coming from some quarters that says, you know, we have business people putting profit ahead of health. They're not putting profit ahead of health. They're putting survival and livelihoods, protection of livelihoods, they're very survival, are saying, I understand the health risk, but I'm having to make a decision, not between making a profit, being able to survive. And that's the point that's been missed in the narrative to date. Thanks, Harry. Brilliant, um, thanks very much, Mark. Um, Kate, can we start to talk about some of the solutions? How are we gonna deal with unprecedented uncertainty and the, the issues faced by businesses today? Well, Harry, really quickly, um, last, I think, April, the federal government determined that access to capital was going to be a very real issue for, for, um, for businesses generally, and they put in place the SME guarantee loan. That was $40 billion set aside where the federal government would pick up half of the risk on those loans. Up until um, the last week, I think we saw some figures, only 1.7 billion 
had actually been um, been lent. Now, the re there was a range of reasons for that, but the major reason is that uh, the banks are struggling to uh, with serviceability requirements on those loans to to look through COVID, as they'd say, to determine what, say, Leah's business is going to look like in six months is really hard for the banks. So on a you know, tick to the bank, I understand that they've, they've got some problems, but from the small business perspective, they don't know what they're gonna look like in six months either. So the confidence to, to take out a loan with, uh, with an interest rate of about 5%, uh, with you know, uh, with payments that will need to be made, um, even if there's a period of time before payments need to be made, businesses are saying, "I'm just not confident enough to take out those loans." But I have to say, not many are getting through the bank process. Some recent um, census figures showed that one in four loans were being knocked back. Um, a number of a pending of you know outcomes. There's all sorts of um, issues in this space. So it's not working. So what will work? We've talked about there needs to be cash flow. So as people have to start paying their commercial lease again at plus deferred um, um, rent, um, they have to start paying the ATO, they have to start paying the bank um, and uh, the gut and job keeper comes off. So they're going to be have to pay their staff as well. And the economy won't bounce back. So what we're suggesting is revenue contingent loans. So that for people who have never sort of thought about that, and you mentioned them, Harry, in your intro, it's a bit like HEX, where you get a loan that you don't pay back until, well, with HEX, until your income is at a particular level. With these loans to small businesses, we're suggesting that you don't start paying back until you're at your revenue is at a particular level, which um, might be 80% of what it was prior to, to COVID or something else. You know, this, is, this can be modelled on what's, on, on what's appropriate. Uh, the benefits of that is a business can, can borrow money, the money that they need, the amount they can borrow should be capped at a percentage of their total, um, their, 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 their total turnover. And that again can be determined. Uh, it might be half, it might be a quarter. Uh, and they can be confident that they can take that loan um, because they only start paying it back when their revenue gets up to a predetermined and agreed level. If, if their revenue falls again, e.g. they're made to close again, they don't have to pay until it gets up to that point again. So you can see that you can have confidence in a loan like that. Um, we could go into lots more at the moment, but I know we're a bit strapped for time, but um, our, in, in talking to a range of people on these sort of loans, business gets that they'd have the confidence to do that because they really can't get into trouble. What we're suggesting though, as I think you mentioned that, is that there's a viability assessment process that you'd need to go through to get one of these loans. So if you're one of the so-called zombie businesses, businesses that really don't have a future at all, um, this isn't an option for you. Um, should be looking at other options like maybe calling it a day sooner rather than later. Um, but for businesses that do have a future, um, a viability assessment, hopefully a turnaround plan um, and um, the confidence that you won't have to pay payments unless your revenue is at a particular level I believe has got, got, got legs. Uh, brilliant. Th thank you, Kate. And certainly, um, you know, a lot of those concepts are captured in our, in our report. And we, we do think the evidence stacks up in favour of um, the revenue contingent loans, uh, the financial health checks, and the, the extension of safe harbour provisions as well. Um, Leo, you represent a range of businesses as a BAS agent. Um, how do you think these measures would be received by your clients? Look, I certainly would be in support of a revenue contingent loan, and I think many of my clients would be also. Um, as Kate mentioned, for our businesses and also for my clients, we just don't know what, what the landscape is going to look like for us. 
and we already have mounting costs and rent that we're going to have to pay and I just can't add to that it's just too big a risk at this point in time um, and also I have seen um, with one of my clients in particular we made some inquiries to the bank um, about the, the guaranteed loans and, and they were nowhere near as easy to obtain as what the government was making out. You know, they were asking for all types of personal security and making it just almost impossible to get. I mean, and to be honest, I don't blame the banks. I mean, if, um, a business like ours has, has not had any revenue in almost six months, so why... Why would a bank lend to us? I wouldn't blame them. Um, but certainly a revenue contingent loan um, would take the risk away because businesses like ours and also my clients um, could take on uh, the money which would help their businesses enormously cash flow wise. And without the risk um, of having to pay it from the first day that we reopened, it just gives that little bit of breathing room, I guess, which I think would be really good. Brilliant. Um, thanks, Leah. Now, I guess we're all in furious agreement on the merits of, of these measures, um, but, but let's not be naive, there are costs involved, and certainly um, we estimated the cost of the voucher scheme, if, um, if it was accessed by eligible businesses, could be up to about $4 billion, which isn't chump change. Um, of course, we argued that uh, it would actually save the government money in, in ensuring the survival of, of, um, of solvent businesses. Um, there is also the risk with a he with a re uh, hex style loan scheme of default, um, and certainly with the existing hex scheme, I think about eighteen percent of um, of the money loaned is essentially written off. Um, again, we argued in our report that this cost, um, that this risk, is more than adequately. Um, outweighed by the benefits, the net benefits to those businesses and to, to society and the economy as a whole. Um, is it worth having a quick, discuss, uh, quick discussion around some of these risks and costs and, um, you know, uh, just weighing up um, the case on, on that point? Mark, do you want to weigh in on this? Well, Harry, I think you've actually summed up the central challenge here. Um, we have a financial ecosystem that doesn't readily accommodate revenue contingent loans. Um, and some of that goes to things like the banking code of practice, which require me as a lender to make sure that the business can repay it responsibly. Um, those sorts of issues to me are fairly trivial because they're issues that if you've got a will here to design around it, and I come back to unprecedented uncertainty, um, if you've got a situation that justifies trying to accommodate a concept, you can find a way around a lot of these things. And I know that the ABA, the Australian Bankers Association, in fact, some of the banks that we've been talking to recently, Kate's had the same conversations, I imagine, are looking at this pretty seriously. There's some issues about how is it treated by the Australian Taxation Office in terms of the liability? How are the loans actually treated? It's a bit different to things like a shadow mortgage where you front end it, because what you're basically doing is not getting any benefit from tax in terms of those provisions and still you start paying it. But to me, they're all sort of fairly small detail. I think the key point is the one you left with. Um, there was some talk some time ago about government making good investment and bad investment. Bad investment is where it's, it, it effectively doesn't generate any flow on benefits. But if you think about what's actually happened here, we've had good businesses that were trading in a very profitable way um, all of a sudden had the tap turned off in terms of customers. They didn't fail because there was a structural problem. They didn't fail because they didn't manage their cash flow under normal circumstances, normal uncertainty. They failed because we had a cataclysmic event in the economy that meant that the foot traffic didn't come through their businesses. So within that context, essentially the fabric or the mechanism of these businesses is pretty sound once we get the economy going again, once we get people going outdoors. And I'm encouraged by things like the analysis that was done recently in the financial figures that showed that in fact, average household income over the June quarter increased as a result of things like JobKeeper and JobSeeker. So money is in the economy, people are saving. So there's a latency that's actually there. So what we have to do is find a solution that takes us forward and revenue contingent loans deal with that uncertainty because I'm not paying for it straight away. But it's a good investment because you've effectively got businesses that for the sake of not having customers because they've been turned off by governments, and that's even more pertinent in the state of Victoria, when those customers come back, 
all that infrastructure around that business, including Leah's business, are ready to click up again. There's nothing fundamentally flawed about the business. So to a certain extent, it's an investment that we're actually making. Now, I think you go back to your point about 18% of HECS, it's about, you know, loans are actually written off. With the current SME system that was in place, the government was underwriting 50% of that. A proportion of those loans were going to fail and the government was going to be paying out for that. And so I think if you take the principle that's in that report that you've tabled about, let's put a test in, as Kate's talked about, an eligibility or a bar to get over to these businesses have not accrued so much debt that they can't climb out of it. And if they pass that, then there's a simple mechanism here that can be put in place and it's worth the effort of looking at how you would actually adapt the financial ecosystem to accommodate it. Can, can I go take over from Mark there and say, I don't know that there's an option to something like this because as JobKeeper comes off, you know, like in March when you, you know, when you've got no more JobKeeper and you've got to pay your staff and you've got to pay the bank and you've got to pay the ATO and you've got to pay your landlord, but business is still, you know, still is, is still not fantastic and it won't be. Um, what, where do you get the, the access to capital for a lot of small businesses at that point that is flexible enough to be able to, to manage situations where um, we can live with COVID? And I think we've got to think about it that way because we won't all be vaccinated by March. We know that. Um, so we know that there will be hopefully only hotspot closed shutdowns like New South Wales at the moment, but these things can happen um, and will happen because we're going to have to live with COVID. Um, hopefully there are only little shutdowns and nothing like Victoria, but we don't know. So we've got to have a method of being able to give businesses access to, to, to cash flow when they can no longer rely on JobKeeper um, or government grants. And it's not a normal traditional bank loan. And Harry, I might build on Kate building on me. I suppose the sense is when a business goes down, the employee, if that business has no cash, the employees don't get paid their entitlements. The suppliers don't get paid the money they're actually owed. The back rent that's actually paid to the landlord does not get paid. And so if we're in a situation here where we can buy those businesses time to trade out of it, but not by putting a structured timetable of repayments in place. That's the difference with RCL. I'm taking on a liability the same way I do with a normal loan, but I'm only committing to a payment schedule that starts when I cross a threshold, an agreed threshold of the revenue that I'm going to allow me to trade out and do my other things. So it's creating that safe protection. I noticed um, one of the, the questioners in the, um, in the chat has actually cited some work that's come from ARETA, which is the Australian Restructure and uh, um, turnover. In, insolvency and turnover, yeah, turnaround. turnaround um, yeah. They're screaming because effectively the safe harbour provisions have meant their work's dried up. But if you have a look at the work that Kate has done in terms of the pattern of performance and the behaviour of that sector for small business, there's some significant challenges there. It is not in our interest to let them loose on small businesses that typically insolvency is you don't have enough money to meet your ongoing debts. The vast majority of businesses won't have that, yeah. but not because they failed through mismanagement, but because they didn't have any business. They need to be given a transition where they can trade out of it. And then we gradually reactivate those provisions over time. So the provision in your report of saying, let's go to March 21, I think Kate and I would probably say, well, let's go to June, September, December 21, um, because we're talking about a significant period here. Um, and so within that context, we have to ease out of these levers gently and we have to minimise the collateral damage. It won't just be the business, it'll be their suppliers, it'll be their landlord, it'll be their staff. And so an RCL, as Kate said, we have no choice. You use that because it will mitigate against the knock-on damage that will be done by large businesses collapsing. Brilliant. Um, Mark, you've alluded there to the questions from the audience and there are some fantastic ones for us. We're rapidly running out of time, so I'll ask that everybody responds with brevity. Um, the first from Luke Arkestrak is a cracker. Is this potentially a good time to increase R&D incentives and grants for SMEs? Many businesses have workers with capacity due to the turnaround, so perhaps this is a good window of opportunity to innovate and develop new products to assist with COVID recovery. 
I'll be brief. I'll say absolutely. And we've got to make sure there's an R&D incentive that works for software in Australia as well, which the current one doesn't work very, very well. Mark, over to you. <laughs> Oh, no, I agree totally, Kate. What Kate said. <laughs> that was easy. Um, we've got another question. Maybe it's a bit trickier. How do you think these loans could be delivered? Uh, if they go through the banks and have to go through the approval processes, surely that will be a barrier to getting loans approved? Um, you know, it will. Um, I'd love to say that it wouldn't be, but just banks are banks. They operate in a particular way. But we've got a number of other um, options that operate inside government. You know, there's the Regional Investment Corporation that that does a range of the rural loans um, at the moment. So there's, there's other mechanisms. You know, we've got a HEX system, heavens, that vaguely works. So, uh, you know, um, I, I think there are, there are other options. I don't believe it's the banks just because they're banks and they, and they will just struggle with, um, with loans that don't have some form of uh, Oh, I don't know, security, director's stuff, anyway, all of that sort of thing. So let's have a look at how HEX is delivered. Let's have a look at the 